Welcome to the British Museum in London and thank you for joining us. I hope you're settled in your seats now, ready to enjoy your very own private view of the British Museum's latest blockbuster exhibition on the Vikings. As we take you through the exhibition, we'll be travelling to four continents and back across a thousand years in time. And we'll be revealing the spectacular centrepiece of this show, the remains of a Viking royal warship. It was an age that helped shape our world. Welcome to Vikings Live. Exhibition, Vikings, Life and Legend, has been years in the planning. It's the first exhibition to be held in the brand new Sainsbury Exhibition Gallery. This massive climate controlled space has become temporary home to over 1,000 objects. the longest Viking warship ever discovered. The curator of the exhibition, Dr Gareth Williams, who is with us tonight, has led a team of experts from the British Museum, along with colleagues in Copenhagen and Berlin, to bring precious objects to London from all over the world. The Queen of Denmark, Her Majesty Margrethe II, was invited to open the exhibition I'm delighted to declare the exhibition Vikings Life and Legend open. She's a dominant descendant of the Viking kings and the What a thrill it is to enter this magical, spectacular space. We've got some of the, the world's great Viking experts with us tonight. But first of all, let's meet the director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor. Hi, Neil, Michael. hi. So why a Viking exhibition and why now? We put on an exhibition when there's new information to present. And we've got a huge amount of new information about the Vikings. There have been great archaeological finds in the last 30 years, you'll see some of them. Mm. We can look at those finds with new scientific techniques, which gives us more information. And since the last exhibition, the Cold War has come to an end, and we can work much more closely with our colleagues in Eastern Europe. So we can now present a quite new view of the Viking world. And a world of extraordinary reach and contacts. So that's what's fascinating. This is a world of water sailing from Scandinavia, from the Baltic. The Vikings go west, of course, to Britain, Ireland, then on to Canada, south to Africa. They go north to the, Afri to the Arctic Circle. And then, perhaps most interesting of all, they go down the great Russian rivers and they get to the Caspian, Central Asia, the Black Sea, Constantinople. It's a whole world that they bring together. It's just amazing, amazing what they achieved, isn't it? So not just a view of the Viking world, but a view of the world, or at least the Western exactly, world, exactly. through the Viking exactly. eyes, if exactly. you like. Yeah. Any particular objects attracted <laughs> your attention, Neil? This is a very difficult question to well, ask you. Well, I mean, obviously they're wonderful mm. objects. The, if I had to steal one, if mm. I were allowed to steal one, I think it would be a tiny little statue in silver of the god of war, Odin, this mm. great masculine god who oversees the, the looting, the raiding, the raping, everything. And this little statue shows him in female dress, keeping in touch with his feminine side, because he's not only the god of war, he's exercising his female skills in magic, sorcery, prophecy. I think that's wonderful, the, these two sides together. And on either side of Odin, the ravens. One raven of memory, one raven of thought. They fly all over the world, and they come back and tell him what's going on. And 
in a sense, that's what we're doing. The exhibition is what we're doing in the British Museum. We are Odin's ravens going all over the world, bringing it together and thinking about it. I never it. saw you as a raven, Neil, but, but it's great. <laughs> well, I, I love it. Happy to be on. Now, we're approaching the Sainsbury Exhibitions Gallery. Yes. Um, a great new space for the museum, isn't it? With uh, conservation facilities and scientific facilities. But also, I guess, it gives you the space to show astonishing things. That's the great advantage of this new space. It allows us, above all, to show the great warship. One of the main discoveries of the last 30 years. And we at last have a space big enough to show it and with the conditions that we need to exhibit it. It's great. great. Well, thanks very, very much. Um, We'll chat a little later, we'll see you a bit later, and we'll see those ships very soon. Good. Viking ship, of course, is the most recognisable symbol of the age, an age which, I guess we could say, extends for about 300 years, from the 750s to the 1060s. And it's the ship which is one of the key themes of the exhibition. Ochther said that the region that he dwelt in is called Halgoland. He said that no man lived to the north of him. There is a port on the southward side of that land that men call Skiringes Hel. He said a man might hardly sail there if he camped at night and had a fair wind each day. Viking homelands are today's Denmark, Norway, Sweden and Finland. The territories are physically fragmented, laced with water. For millennia, this meant that transport was much easier by river, fjord and sea than by land. The tribal farming societies here had access to rich goods, furs, whalebone, amber and walrus ivory marketable resources that the Vikings would trade once they went global. And as they traveled and traded and raided, they shaped not just the past, but the world we all live in today. Now, what it's critical to remember is that the name Viking didn't originally refer to a single ethnic group. Today we use the word Viking to describe all Scandinavian society from 750 AD onwards. But when it first appears in Old Norse, Vikinger actually just means a pirate or a raider. And of course, a pirate is not a pirate without his or her ship, which is why, Professor Neil Price, the exhibition starts with this really exquisite representation of a Viking ship. Absolutely. And the reason it's at the beginning is that this is the absolute key to the Viking Age. Without the ship, none of this would happen at all. What we've got here is a this beautiful brooch um, from Denmark made of copper. And you've got the classic Viking ship, these beautiful clean lines, the dragon heads at either end, uh, the square sail. You can see it furled on the mast there. And if you look very closely, all along the hull are these little circular things which are either shields or um, the, the holes for the oars. And why do we have this special relationship between Vikings and boats? I mean, what, why is the boat so central to their identity? The really critical thing to understand about the Viking period in Scandinavia is that this is a maritime society. Everything depends on the sea and the rivers and access to water. One way or another, everybody was affected by the sea and they had some kind of contact with the, the means of transport to get out onto it. And that's so important to remember, isn't it? Because I think when we think of Vikings, we kind of automatically imagine macho male warriors. But, but, but as you say, this is something that everybody at every level of society is involved with. And, and really, everybody. Um, what we're coming to here is two of my really favourite exhibits in, in the show. Um, these are toys, and the lives of Viking children are some of the most inaccessible aspects of the Viking Age. It's so hard to reach Viking kids. Um, but 
every now and then when we're lucky enough to get um, preservation conditions that um, mean that wood and organic things survive, we get things like this, little toy boats. The smaller one at the top is from Dublin, um, the lower one here is from Hedeby in Denmark, and I think it, it's easy to imagine little Viking girls and boys um, floating these down the, the streams. So it really is everyone in Viking society that has the ship in their minds. I mean, something like this tells us what Vikings of all ages did, but can the archaeology ever get us into their minds, into the Viking mind? Yes, I think it can. Um, one of the, the, um, the exciting things about uh, Viking material culture, um, the things they made, is that wherever possible they decorated them. We've just seen this, this ship brooch, um, a ship you can wear. So some, some Viking person has had this on their clothes. But the same idea goes through anything that you can decorate. So um, jewellery is not just something to hold your clothes together. It's a, it's a visual world full of um, decoration and, um, and art with meaning. A weapon is not just something to bash people with. It's covered in decoration. So you see some of these things here. Look in the, the middle here, this, this beautiful dress pin with the, with the dragon head. This is something to hold your cloak together, um, but it's not just a functional object. This, this marvellous head on the top there um, looks like a dragon. This, is, this leads us into this, this thought world of, of mythological creatures, the, the invisible population of supernatural beings with which the Vikings shared their world. And what's so important, isn't it, to remember at this time is we shouldn't really be using words like religion and, and belief because th those weren't options for the Vikings. I mean, for them, dragons were, were real. Absolutely. I, I think we should talk about knowledge. If, if, uh, if you can imagine asking a Viking, do you believe in trolls? Do you believe in Odin? It's like asking, do you believe in the sea? It, it's, it's, it's something obvious. It's, it's, uh, when we use the word supernatural, it's entirely wrong. They're natural, purely natural. But our best chance to really get inside the Vikings' heads is through burials, because unlike all the rest, they're deliberate. So when we find a, a, a Viking grave and excavate it, we're encountering something that is a direct product of the Vikings themselves, what they wanted to do. Burials contain all kinds of different things, um, from the most mundane objects, uh, items of personal dress, um, things you clean your ears with, there's, there's um, ironing boards, all kinds of things like that, um, weapons, of course, and all the way up to the, the biggest things of all, ships. Yeah, because sometimes they're actually buried in ships, aren't they, in, in boats? They certainly are. Well, we're actually reconstructing a Viking boat burial, aren't we? We are, yeah. And so is it going to be your sort of archaeologist's dream burial? You're going to put in everything there that you would love to find in the ground? Up to a point. We'll have a go, yeah. OK, see what we can do. Make those Vikings live. So when you find a, a dead person with all the objects laid out around them, they're there because the Vikings wanted them to be there. And what do you think the ships in those graves actually mean? What do they represent? It's hard to really say, but um, they could be a means of transport to, to take the dead to wherever it is they're going, a, a ship from this world into another world. Equally, they might just be the most expensive possession of the dead person or their community, a bit like being buried in your Mercedes. Fantastic sources of information and they're fantastic windows on that Viking mind. See where the long-sighted warship lies, splendid off the shore. The bright dragon's mane above the cargo shines. Since he was launched from rollers, his decorated neck is burnished with gold.
The vessels of the early Viking period were relatively small, with crews of around 40 men. But through the Viking Age, ships grew larger and more sophisticated. They were powered not only by many oars, but by splendid sails. As so often, technology matched desire. An impulse for exploration and a hunger for wealth powered the development of both deeply built cargo ships that could cross oceans and great warships. These were the true Viking longships, which in fleets could conquer nations. And the largest warship ever discovered is at the heart of the exhibition. And this is it, the longest Viking ship ever found. And not only that, but the remains of a royal warship. What's been teased out of the earth has been housed in this giant steel frame to give us a sense of the scale and size of the original ship. And you just have to think of it in its prime almost exactly a thousand years ago nudging its way out to the sea, 100 men on board, 80 rowers powering those oars, and up above them a giant mast with a sail made of wool or linen, dyed in bright colours. They're wonderful ships. They are, they are remarkable boats, and they are very, very good sea, very extremely seaworthy boats. I think that's one of the things that always excite me when I see them. They have made quite a lot of, several full-sized copies of Viking ships. And if you see a boat like that on the sea, but you imagine when you suddenly look out to sea and you suddenly find that half the horizon is full of them, I think you really, your heart went to the bottom of your boots. The remains of this magnificent ship were found by chance in 1996 in a harbour just next to the Viking Ship Museum at Roskilde in Denmark. Workers were dredging the harbour to expand the museum and unearthed a ship's graveyard right beneath their feet. It must have felt like a gift from the old gods. Getting the ship's timbers safely onto dry land and over here was an immensely delicate operation. And one of the people responsible for that and then the two-week job of installing them in the exhibition is Christiana Strettkevern, working with curator Gareth Williams. The discovery of the ship's a fascinating story, isn't it? Not only is it the longest one, but uh, we can see from the ship timbers that is dated back to 1025, which you know, but also the dendrochronology showed that the ship was built in Norway. Uh, while we were investigating the ship, we could see that there were repairs. They uh, show that the ship has been repaired in the Baltic area in 1039, meaning that the ship has been sailing from Oslo to the Baltic and ends up in the bottom of Roskilde Fjord. So it, it has an amazing story, really, before it ends up there. They, they put the ship together with lots of small parts and pieces and then they fit it together with all these smaller parts, also with the, 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 the ribs that will come in between. And all these fittings, it makes, it makes the ship flexible and, and strong. Yes, we can see very clearly here how the planks themselves are riveted together oh, yes. with the square yeah. rove plate for the plank. So each of these 
uh, major ribs, marks where a rowing bench would have yes, been. Yes, exactly. So we have a, a rowing bench across the, the ship on mm. top of that. Yeah. And that gives us the space between the rowing benches that helps us estimate the overall length of the missing parts and gives us an idea of the total idea of the total size of the crew. Yes, that's true. And we know there'd have been a steersman as well at the back and the steering oar on one side. The yes. steerage board gives us, of course, the modern name starboard yeah. for this site, the yes, right hand side of the, side, of, yes, of the ship. True. But we also hear in historical accounts about forecastle men so there'd be extra fighting men at the front of the boat. With this width, there's space for more than just the two people to either side. Mm. So how many, how many do you think the total crew would have been for this? Uh, the estimate is approximately 100, 100 people on board this ship. Um, and they would live here, and they would row, and they would sail, and they would do everything you need to do. They are, they are now putting in First of all, the plank line, the steel line, has to be there, and they are looking on the on the drawing to figure out the exact number of the plank and the exact placement. And we are building this part now, and we have laid out plank number five and six. So this one here, this is the keel. The, the, the keel is the is the full length of the ship. In fact, the keel from one from the aft to the front was 32 meter, and that is the longest keel ever found in a, in a Viking ship. The remains of Roskilde VI hint at the skills that went into this high point of Viking craftsmanship. And colleagues from the National Maritime Museum in Cornwall are using traditional tools to show the shipbuilding techniques of a thousand years ago. So Mike, cross section of a Viking ship. I've always wanted to see one of these. <laughs> Tell us about... Uh, how they did it? Well, we start with the keel and what's essentially the backbone of the ship to which we add the stem post and that has a special joint. And, and the keel enables a boat to keep way, especially if it's under sail. The, uh, the lightness of the construction uh, enabled the boat to flex and do, and also the flatness of the keel almost created a planing hull, which enabled the boat to move very quickly through water. It's like the descriptions in the poetry, isn't it, of them almost yes. gliding across the surface yes. of the sea. And I think it was a, a, a slow evolution because they got braver and braver as they built their ships in a more seaworthy state. Mm. So uh, as with everything, it's not just one design that goes on a drawing board, it, it becomes an evolution. It's, it's almost as if uh, the technology grew as the desire grew and the curiosity grew, isn't I, it? You I know, think that's very true. Oh, we've reached yeah. Iceland, let's go to Greenland. And, oh, let's yeah. see what's over there. Yeah, and it must have been pretty scary when they were heading out. And maybe did we think we fell over the edge of the ocean then? Right. I don't know, but uh, certainly the voyages were fantastic. Right. And, and it's clinker built. They, clinker we, we call built. it clinker built, don't yep. we? We always taught that at school. Yep. What does that actually mean? Well, clinker is um, a Danish word, I understand, and that's where it developed from. So uh, in America, they call it lapstrake, which is probably a more accurate description. Yeah. And, uh, and then we fasten with, uh, with nails. With nails? Yeah. Yeah, we... Um, they use nails, metal nails. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. and, uh, and we use these uh, little washers or uh, roves, which uh, they're fastened through. Shall I show you how that's yeah, done? Yeah, please. yeah, please. Brian, can you uh, give me a hand? Hi, Brian. How are you doing, all right? <laughs> all right, yeah. <sighs> so we put the, uh, the nail through. Ready? Yep. And then the rope goes on. And then we peen the nail head o over. Yes. Okay. Okay. How long do you think it took them to actually make one of these? Well, we know for a fact, uh, Roskilde Museum in Denmark, they built a, a full size version of this, 60 foot. And uh, I, it took them about 18 months with a team of about maybe 10 men. Wow. Uh, but in, in the Viking days, I think they would do much faster because they were very skilled people. They're used to building them. 
mass produced, maybe. You well, know, more or you, less, you, yeah. almost, you almost yeah. think that, don't you? Yeah. And just about the shape, Brian. I mean, how do you get this lovely curve? All the, you know, when you hear the poems of the mm. the Viking Age, they talk about the, my curving ship, my slender ship. How do you get that? I think once the shipwright, boat builder, decided on the ship he wanted, how wide he wanted it, how long he wanted it, then it's simply a matter of steam your planks around. Steam your you planks? Steam Hang your on a planks around. Steam your planks? Yeah. And people who've sailed these as reconstructions say that in any, even a medium sea, they sort of twist as they sail. Does that make They're, sense to you? Well, part of the Viking boats was their lightness. They were built light for speed and for, for instance, beaching them and raiding. And they were all nailed together, so the boats twisted quite a lot. And that was part of their character and part of the whole structure of the boat. Made them able better to cope with difficult seas, I suppose, Right, as well. very heavy seas, because they were so light. And just finally, decoration. I mean, we have this image, don't we, of Viking ships with their great prows. There's a wonderful account of um, the Viking attack on Paris by a yes. French monk who says yeah. that as they came up the Seine, the people were astonished to see these rows of the great prows coming down the river. We couldn't even see the water, he says. It was like a forest. Yeah. Um, visual impact as well, do you think? I think certainly to frighten. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But there were so many variations in styles. They wouldn't worry too much about ornamentation on a, on a medium warship. Let's just get over to England and plunder it. That's about it, yeah. <laughs> and you've got a, a figurehead for us today, I think. We have. We made a figurehead specially for this project that was based on the pinhead that is on exhibition in the museum. In the museum. And uh, if you'd like to come round and have a look. Yeah. Shall I come? Then, yes, please. Whoa. Don't grab him by the ear. <laughs> Hands underneath the chops. Never tweak a sleeping dragon under the ears. Don't hold it down, Wrong way around. <laughs> Whoa, that's magnificent. Over a bit. Yep. journeyed boldly, went far for gold, fed the eagle out in the east, and died in the south, in Saracen land. Journey boldly in quest of gold and prepare to die in foreign lands. Now that's what the literature says and Gareth Williams here is the lead curator of this wonderful exhibition. And those themes of travel and exploration are really central, aren't they, to your organisation here? Absolutely. The exhibition is very much one about the wider Viking world, not just about the Vikings in Scandinavia or in Britain, but that wide, unprecedented world spanning four continents that the Vikings created. And that is driven by contacts, interactions, and the travel that underlied that. Yeah, and, and your beautiful objects represent that travel. Absolutely. Um, here's a, a case in point. This may not look much today, but this is silk. It's come from somewhere at the eastern end of the Viking world, maybe the Byzantine Empire, maybe the Islamic Caliphate, and it's ended up right across at the other side of the Viking world in Dublin in Ireland. I mean, something like that, as you say, it doesn't look like much on the face of it, but you have to think what that represents, don't you? That I think we often imagine in our heads the Vikings in sort of sackcloth and kind of putty colours, but they used to wear gorgeous textiles and cloths woven with gold and silver. I mean, that little silk scrap is just a, just a tiny fragment of that. They, they had access to a wide variety of brightly coloured dyes. That's all been leached out of it by the wet conditions which enabled the fabric itself to survive. But this would have been bright and beautiful. There's no evidence in this example of gold and silver thread, but they're there in other silks of the period. I mean, this must have been very fragile to deal with. Is, is it the most fragile exhibit here? It's one of the most fragile, but probably the most fragile is a group of material from a boat burial in Ardnamurchan in Western Scotland. That was found only in 2011. 
it's still not been fully conserved. And that means that it's very fragile, very unstable. We're lucky to have been able to display it to the public for the first time here. And you'll see when you look at it, the iron is rustier than any of the other material in the exhibition because it's not yet been fully conserved. And that's so brittle and flaky that putting that in place has been an enormous job because there are so many pieces as well. There are hundreds of rivets in the boat as well as the larger burial goods. It's taken a small team, two or three days, to get every piece of that in place. Huge job. Rust has never had so much loving attention, I suspect. Indeed. And I'm glad you showed me that, that little Byzantine bit of silk because Byzantium and Constantinople was terribly important to the Vikings, wasn't it? Absolutely. It's very different from anything they knew in Northern Europe. We hear about Constantinople as a Miklagard, the great city. And both the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world offered much more sophistication and civilization than the Vikings were used to. And they were capable of learning from it and taking new ideas, new objects. But equally, they left things behind them everywhere they went. Let me show you here some examples. These are two burials, one from Denmark and one from Norway. And both you see contain these oval brooches. That's what the well-dressed Viking lady wore in this period. Two brooches pinning an apron dress to her shoulders. And these are absolutely typically Viking. But we find them across the Viking world as well. We've got three more sets here. This one from Ireland, this from Yaroslavl in modern Russia, and some from Kiev in modern Ukraine. So the fashions, then as now, Scandinavian fashion was hugely desirable. And so we see the well-dressed Viking lady much the same wherever she is in the Viking world. Interesting that you say these pieces are from modern day Russia and these are from Ukraine. Where do you stand on that debate as to whether the Vikings, who were often known as the Rus, whether they gave their name to Russia? Are, are the Vikings the ancestors of modern day Russia? They're certainly some of the ancestors of modern day Russia. The word Russia comes from the name Rus. As you say, that's sometimes certainly used of people who are clearly Vikings. It's also used of the mixed society that develops in earlier Russia, which contains Vikings and Slavs and other people like the Khazars. So it's not an ethnically pure society. It's a mixed society of which the Vikings are a key element. I, mean, I imagine, with, with the opening up of the old Soviet Union, that must have given a lot of new territories for you as an, as an archaeologist to, to learn from, and presumably some new objects that kind of came into the global scene. Absolutely. It's fantastic to have as much material as we have in this exhibition from Eastern Europe, a lot of it never shown before in this country. But it's also the opening up of the academic subject under the former Soviet Union the history of Greater Russia was purely Slavic. So there was no real academic dialogue. We all knew that the Vikings had been in that area. But now we're able to discuss just how much influence there was. And Russian and other Eastern European scholars are part of that discussion, as well as lending us their objects. So it's a wonderful new source of information. But we also have new sources of information of our own. There's new material turning up all the time in this country, and metal detecting has been a major source of that. Just over here, we've got one of the most exciting finds in the exhibition, to my mind, and one that I've been working on ever since it was found in 2007. So talk me through it, Gareth, because this is real treasure. Absolutely. What we've got here is around 700 individual items, all found together and buried around about 927 to 928 AD. Why are they buried, do you think? Well, it's a key moment in English history. England was unified for the first time. Athelstan, the grandson of Alfred the Great, conquered the Viking kingdom of Northumbria, and this was buried within that kingdom. So almost certainly it's a powerful Viking hiding his treasure at this time of conflict and then the unification of England. But what's really exciting about this hoard is we've got the whole of the Viking world buried in a single cup. We've got items from the, uh, the Irish Sea, we've got items from England, both Anglo-Saxon and Viking England, from the Frankish kingdoms on the continent, from Russia, 
and the coins at the far end of the case from the Islamic world from as far away as Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Now you're probably thinking, where's the cup? <laughs> and I've got it out ready for you here. I thought you'd like a, a look at it. Gareth, so if you can, I'm eternally grateful. Well, if you can put some gloves on. Because this, uh, this is the most exquisite thing, this. I do know this cup. How do you think 700 items fitted into that? It kind of seems like well, they couldn't. Well, I, I helped to unpack it, so um, I know exactly how they fit it in. All very tightly packed inside there. The coins are very, very thin. They're slipped in between the larger items. And then just a few pieces, the very largest bits, resting on top and all held together with lead wrapped around it, sheet lead wrapped around. It's just... I can't tell you how brilliant it is to be close to this, because it is so beautiful in so many ways. It's close on 1,200 years old. It's exquisite. I mean, the workmanship on that is just fabulous, it's stunning, isn't, it? isn't it? Really fabulous. But I think I, I, I love it best because of the story it tells. Beautifully worked and covered with animals, lions and lionesses and, and a few deer, presumably being chased um, by, the, by the carnivores. We know that this is from a church, so we know that this is some kind of sacred vessel. Probably, do you think, for communion bread? Very likely, yes. Yeah. We can't say exactly where it came from, but probably France, Belgium, Netherlands, Western Germany. And it's, we can say it's a church cup because it's gilt inside and out. And this line around the top, it's a line of vine leaves, and the vine as a symbol for Christ as the one true vine of the church. Mm. Very likely the animals around the edge. We've got this beautiful lion here, um, and then these deer being chased. It's almost like a hunting scene, but it may well be a scene from the Bible. Can I hold it? If you're very careful. I promise, I'll be very careful. And I'll tell you why I want to hold it. Actually, it's quite heavy. It's heavier than I was expecting. Just because I think this cup contains such a story. It's got that veil of York hoard inside it. But originally this would have been used for communion bread, wouldn't it? Very likely. And, you know, what's, how has it ended up in England? Was it given as some kind of Viking blood money as a sort of forced tribute demanded by the Vikings for, to ensure a sort of peremptory peace? Or, I don't know if you think more likely, was this snatched? from the hands of a priest, taken in a raid on a church. I mean, it, it, you know, this would tell quite a story if it could speak. Absolutely, and I think that's another of the wonderful things about this hoard. There's a big debate about the character of the Vikings. Were they raiders or traders? Well, the coins coming right away across the Viking world from the far eastern side of that, they're probably coming through trade. But something like this, this is raiding. Whether it's tribute or loot, this is the product of Viking raiding in continental Europe. And that takes us right back to where the whole idea of Vikings started from. Yeah. And what you've got to remember as well is that those Vikings we're talking about, those men on the raids, I mean, you, you'd know this from the bone evidence, quite often they're teenagers, they're in their early 20s, so you've got to think of these pumped-up lads tearing into this Frankish church and stealing it. Yes, but what is remarkable, despite that, is this has re remained intact. This yeah. has not just been broken up for use as precious metal, this has been treasured and kept and buried perhaps as much as 100 years after it was made. Amazing. So the Vikings appreciated good workmanship in others. It really is a traveller in time. Definitely. Yes, <laughs> I can tell you were itching to get it back. <laughs> Safe and sound. So the Vikings were ready to head out across the world, and I'm with somebody who's done that, Sir Robin Knox Johnson. Great to be with you tonight, Robin. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, it's an obvious question, but what's it actually like to sail across the ocean in northern climes in an open boat? <laughs> well, I think the simple answer is it's probably quite cold. <laughs> but, you know, they lived in their time. They were used to adjusting to it. But when we crossed the North Sea in a boat, I mean, we had furs, and we just covered ourselves with them. And actually, we were 
Warmest toast inside that. That was in a Viking replica sailing from Bergen to the Shetlands. That's right, yeah, a, a yeah. trading ship, yeah. Anar, yes. So sitting on their rowing benches, did that give you a sense of what they were like as sailors and as people? It did a bit. I mean, all the crew apart from myself were Norwegians or Danes. And um, Yes, it was. It was quite interesting. Uh, you know, the boat actually was incredibly seaworthy. You felt very safe in it. Mm. But it, it handled easily. I mean, it was fascinating. We had enough crew to manage it. We didn't row, I have to own it. And food, what about food? What did they survive on, do you think? Well, we tried it. We used salt cod. Ah. I have to say, actually, it was really rather nice. Yeah, yeah. I suspect, you know, you'd hang out a few carcasses in the rigging, eat off that. Yeah. And they had um, deep frozen cod out on wooden racks up in Svalbard, even until recently, didn't they? That's I think right. they, they took those on their Viking ships. But navigation, most of all, Robin, um, how did they do these extraordinary voyages across to, you know, northern Canada and places like that? Did they have any navigational instruments? Well, they had to have some things that enabled them to orienteer, we know that. And one of the things they might have had is, is this basically a sun compass. Oh. And all you do is go out and plot the shadow of that from the sun on that and make a curve. Next day, turn it round till that shadow hits that curve. Where the curve's closest to the middle is north. Simple. There's been a lot of argument about this, hasn't there? I mean, they haven't found one of these yet in a Viking context, but you're pretty sure that they, they had something extra like well, that. Well, actually, we found two. Uh, one in uh, Greenland, mm -hmm. in the remains of a convent, and more recently, they found one on the River Odo, it's a Viking settlement. So we're pretty convinced that the main point is it does work. Great. Well, thanks ever so for giving us an insight into what it actually felt like to be a Viking. <laughs> thanks very much, Robin. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Here, terrible portents appeared over the land of the Northumbrians that miserably frightened the people. There were great storms of lightning and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. A great famine soon followed those signs and a little after that, in the same year, on the 8th of January, an assault of wretched heathen men destroyed God's church on the island of Lindisfarne by robbery and slaughter. As the Vikings spread out from their homelands, many sailed west to Britain and Ireland. Early raids targeted coastal monasteries, easily accessible by ship, undefended, and rich in church treasure. The Viking attack on the Northumbrian monastery at Lindisfarne in 793 is generally seen to mark the start of Britain's Viking Age. In the 780s and 790s, we start getting the first reports from British and Irish monasteries of this first phase of Viking raiding, almost like news bulletins from across the British Isles. In Ulster, in Latin, they speak of the vastatio, the devastation of the island of Britain. In Gaelic, of the ruin of the great shrine on Iona. In Northumbria, the devastation of their most sacred place in Lindisfarne was felt to be so shocking, so unprecedented, that it must be a visitation from heaven, accompanied by omens, by fiery lights, firen draken on tham lufta, fiery dragons in the northern sky. The motive for these early raids was, of course, plunder, loot, treasure, slaves, you name it, and they took it. Here in this case, two wonderful examples. The little box there, perhaps originally a reliquary containing the bone of a saint, maybe plundered from an Irish monastery, now with an inscription underneath saying, Ranveig owns this box. A Viking woman's name, perhaps her husband brought it back from a raid. And above it, this magnificent uh, neck adornment. Uh, perhaps melted down loot from a Viking raid found in Norway, and in the hammered, flattened ends, an inscription saying, we fared down to Frisia, 
the coast of Holland and there exchanged war garments with the Frisians. In other words, we slaughtered them and stripped their bodies of their war gear. A very dark, dry line in irony the Vikings had. Now, the size of these early expeditions, maybe at most 30 or 40 ships, and scholars for a while have believed that the armies themselves were correspondingly small, maybe only a few hundred at most. But quite sober chronicles soon begin to talk of fleets of 200, 300, 615 ships coming from Dublin to invade Northumbria in 937. And they don't have to be the size of the Roskill ship with 80 rowers to suggest an army of, well, thousands, thousands. And the very latest evidence, very exciting evidence it is too, has come from the excavation of a Viking camp in North Yorkshire. This material here, these coins and beads came from that site. It's a 35 acre site, uh, plenty big enough to take an army of many thousands. Terrifying it must have been. No wonder those monks thought that it was all a sign of God's anger. with bloody sword and a resounding spear to a hard Viking attack. We had a raging fight. Fire raced over houses. I made bloody bodies fall within city walls. Gareth Cole, oh, that is impressive. <laughs> Fabulous. There's nothing like seeing a Viking warrior close up. It looks as if it weighs a ton. It does well, Phil, for yourself. Oh, wow. And this isn't as big as the, uh, the ones that have been excavated, is it's it? It's about the same size as yeah. some of them, but it's yeah. not as big as the largest ones. Yeah. Terrific. So this is all part of the protective gear of a... What, what kind of status are you? Um, fairly, fairly high status, not yeah. absolutely top. I'm, yeah. I'm fairly wealthy, as you can see, from the assorted jewellery and weapons, but yeah. not absolute top of yeah. the tree. Yeah. And the shield, made of wood, but with a leather coating, helps bind the individual planks together. Yeah. And the metal boss, this is the one part that normally survives, like the one behind you in yeah. the case there. Yeah. So normally, all we have surviving is the boss. We do have one example in the exhibition of a complete shield from the Gokstad burial. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Let's take the helmet off. Good yeah, idea. A, we can see you, and B, this must be very hot under the lights. God. <laughs> it's a little on the warm side. But fighting a battle in this kind of gear is a strenuous... It, it is, uh, and we have accounts of, of battles fought on hot days, the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Uh, it was so hot, the Norwegians took their armour off and fought without it and were killed. Yeah. And it's a very different style of fighting. If you're used to fighting without armour, you can move more quickly, yeah. but you're used to protecting yourself in a different way. You take chances if you're wearing mail, because with this mail over padding, I've got leather oh, under there, yeah. leather over wool, over linen, yeah. over my normal clothes. Yeah. And then the helmet protects the head. Yeah. So a huge investment in on the body of a Viking warrior. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. There's something like six months of work goes into making this. The shirt, <laughs> you can see if you look closely, every link riveted closed. And some have that, some have 
um, solid rings mixed in with rivet. It stops them springing apart. But the amount of labour that goes into that, as well as yeah. just the raw materials, it, it's, it's colossal. Yes, fantastic. Let's put that over there. And just show us some of the weapons. Uh, let's look at the sword, Gaff. Come on, these are... Well, the sword is the ultimate status weapon <laughs> for the Viking warrior. Wow. No curator should do without one. Uh, absolutely. Comes uh, in very handy on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, actually, y y you know, it, you get a better idea of, of it looking at these new remade weapons than anything I've ever seen. It's really fabulous, isn't it? And these were incredibly expensive at the time, when you look at the wills, weren't they? I yes. Mean, you, you know, the, you're, I was trying to work it out. It's the equivalent of an incredibly high-end sports car in terms of modern purchasing power, For the, to, the top-level sword, yeah. and the swords come in various values. It's, if you look at the different swords in this exhibition, we've got some quite plain ones. Those are maybe not in quite the luxury league. But then we've got the designer swords. <laughs> um, there's one particular sword maker, Ulfbert. He's such a successful name, he's such a successful brand, that we get swords with the Ulfbert name etched into the blade or inlaid in for probably 200 years. Designer blades, it's fabulous, isn't it? It, it is, and yeah. like designer labels today, yeah. Recent analysis of the blades show that they were the cheap knockoffs as well. Yeah. So there are blades which it's been calculated are so badly made with that label on, they fall apart the first time you use them in, in battle. It's the m m Viking equivalent of the knockoff Louis Vuitton handbag. Yeah, and, and looking at some of these exhibits, personal adornment. I mean, they're real individualists, aren't they, some of these Viking leaders um, in the sources? And, and that suggests it, doesn't it? Filed teeth. Yes, this is an extreme example. There's a, a small number of these known, always from warrior graves, so with horizontal file marks probably coloured in on the teeth. It's, on the one hand, immediately recognisable. It's also saying very clearly, if I'm willing to do this to myself, mm. what am I willing to do to you? Mm. And meeting that on the battlefield, quite terrifying. But we also have accounts of the Vikings with tattoos from the tips of their fingers to their necks, and to both men and women in the Viking age wearing makeup to make their eyes brighter. So we, we can imagine these highly decorative warriors. It's like Pirates of the Caribbean, isn't it? Kind of Johnny Depp goes Viking. Exactly, yes. exactly. I, th I think that's a very yeah. good analogy. Yeah. But um, the, the leaders with their by names, you know, Ragnar Lothbrok and uh, Hairy Breaches and all those kind of beliefs. Yes. They, they are, these, are, these are guys whose fame went before them, I suppose. Yes, and, and some of those names, very clear where they come from. You know, a name like Thorfinn Skullsplitter, no mm. guesses how he got that name. Yeah, yeah. Einar Buttered Bread, slightly harder to mm. tell. Eric Bloody Axe, I've yes. always loved him. Yes, one of my favourites as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, battles, Gareth, I mean, we read rather conventional battle descriptions, don't we, in the poetry, both the Norse poetry and the Anglo-Saxon poetry. Yes. You know, hacking the shield wall, uh, board wheel, kluffan, and all this sort of stuff. Did they make shield walls? How did they actually fight in battle line? Do well, we know? The shield wall seems to be, and we have one or two surviving representations of this in stone carvings and so on, you stand in a line, all the shields overlapping, and that provides a solid wall. Um, and it's, if someone's charging into that, you can make quite a solid barrier against that. The difficulty with that is if you've got a sword or an axe like the one I have here, to use this effectively. And again, axe, a very common weapon of the Viking Aid. You need room to swing that effectively. If you're packed mm. in with people around you, you can't swing that. Mm. Uh, so there's no room to use that. And that, I think, is where the sax, the fighting knife, comes in. It's useful at close quarters. <laughs> And this is blunted for safety, Whoa. but the real examples have wicked points. And although you can use it as a cutting weapon, yeah. it's ideal at close quarters. You can go over the shield, you can go under the shield. <laughs> and um, there's a skeleton at Repton with serious injuries to the th inner mm. thigh. Yeah. Um, it's been suggested that particular warrior may even have been castrated. Well, an upwards blow with one of these under the shield, yes. what better way to do it? And death in battle, I mean, thousands of Vikings died violent deaths in the Viking Age, didn't they? What did they think happened to them after death? Well, according to the later traditions, which is what we mostly have, and these are mediated 
through a Christian viewpoint, they believed that they would go to Valhall, the Hall of the Slain, and they'd feast there and fight there. I mean, it's great. Every day you can go out, fight, get killed, wake up again in the evening, get drunk, and do it all again the, the, the next day. Mm. So it was the perfect afterlife for a warrior. Mm. Warrior, they'd be waiting for the great battle of Ragnarok at the end of time. But until then, it was a great afterlife and something to aspire to. Only the best warriors were chosen. And that meant that the Viking gods, and Odin in particular, was a pretty fickle god to worship because he wanted the best warriors on his side, which meant he wanted them dead and in Valhall waiting for that battle that might come. So, a treacherous god to worship. Mm. Fantastic. And I've got to ask you this, Gareth. I mean, you know, I've, I've known you for all these years as a scholar of the age, and here we are, and you're in this gear, and you're telling me these stories, your eyes are blazing. This is a world which obviously has captivated you for a long time. What, what is it about it that gets you...? Well, I've, I've loved the Vikings since I was a small child. I still remember the last exhibition back here in 1980 yes, yes, being brought along as a birthday treat. Mm. But, yeah, the Vikings grab the imagination. And actually, all of this stuff, maybe there's still a little boy dressing up in there, um, but there's also a lot of practical experimentation. I first got into this talking to a reenactor. I asked him what he'd learned from doing it, and he said, well, wouldn't you learn more just trying it yourself? I thought, yeah. fair enough, and that's 15 years ago. And there's something about their character as well, though, isn't it? Don't you think? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, when you read their proverbs and their words of wisdom, there's such stuff down to earth clarity about life, isn't there? What, what do you think? Well, ab absolutely. I think the, that just laconic humour is very much in keeping with our own today. Mm -hmm. they, they've got a certain sense of grim style. Of course, thousands of Vikings died violent deaths during the Viking Age, and these are some of them. These bones are part of an extraordinary, thrilling find that was made only recently, 2009, near Weymouth in Dorset, when a bypass was being built. And there, in a lonely coombe, in an old Roman quarry, were found the bones of around 50 men. Here's the clues. The age range, most of them between 18 and 25. The isotopes in their teeth showed that they came from the Scandinavian region, not one country, but the countries around the Baltic. The carbon dating suggested a date between, say, the 970s and the 1020s. In other words, the reign of Ethelred the Unready, the period in English history when the Viking Danish invasions were resumed and wars were fought with incredible bitterness and savagery right across England. The historian, of course, can't resist speculating who are they, why were they here, when did it happen? They could just have been a boatload of Danes who got lost and ran out of luck, were killed by the locals during those wars. They might even be mercenaries. Ethelred's government employed Danish mercenaries who on one occasion turned against their employers. Maybe these were those kind of men who were captured and killed by the the local Earl and his thanes, because they weren't killed in battle. They haven't got war wounds. Um, they heads were severed and left to one side in the death pit. There are skulls with slash marks of swords across them. There's a hand even. You can see the bones. Perhaps the person lifted the hand up to protect themselves and their fingers were cut off. So who were they? They may be something to do with one of the most infamous uh, moments in the story of Ethelred's reign, the so-called Massacre of St. Brice's Day, 13th of November, 1002, 
when Ethelred's government, in despair about the incessant Danish attacks, gave the order, so it's thought, to massacre the Danes of the population of towns in southern England, towns like Oxford. We don't know whether it was carried out everywhere, but it seems to have happened in some places. We'll never know for sure, of course, but it's a, a chilling pointer to the ethnic tensions which could still bubble up in a country which had been a mixed Anglo-Danish society for more than a century. Chop wood in the wind, row out to sea in good weather, speak to a girl in the dark, the day's eyes are many. You need a ship for gliding, a shield for protection, a sword for striking, a maiden for kissing. Viking poetry does, I mean, on the face of it, at any rate, seem to be describing a pretty male world. There's all this macho talk about battles and swords and shields and the odd mention of a yearning for a kind of good woman. So where are all the Viking women? Where's the female of the species in all of this? She's everywhere. I mean, if you're thinking about Viking armies, there's plenty of evidence that they took women and children with them on their, especially if they were away from home over many years. Um, but probably most women stayed at home um, and they, were, they had full authority within the home. They were there making sure the household was fed and clothed um, and looking after the, the young and the old and the sick. And do they have status? I mean, we, we, there's some gorgeous objects in front of us here, some of which I know belonged to women. And, you know, they look like the woman who wore that would have had, commanded quite some respect. Well, well there's, a, there's a chain there that's made of gold. Um, it's a practical item. It's, it's for hanging your keys in. Uh, women were in charge of, of all the, the chests and everything that was the... Uh, belongings of the household, so she had kept the keys. But for the chain to be gold, that would have been a very high status woman. And next to it, we have a woman perhaps from a slightly different class. These, these two oval brooches are the characteristics of your average Viking woman of the free class, uh, the wife of the head of the household, the mistress of the household, uh, who had complete charge and authority within the household. And then next to it, there's uh, also a, a wonderful little object, which is an ear scoop for cleaning your ears out. <laughs> and that's made of gold as well. So a practical object, but uh, showing the status of its owner. Yeah, I think we should bring back ear scoops in the they 21st century. It'd be very useful. <laughs> Use them in polite society. It'd be <laughs> great, wouldn't it? And what about religion? Because what you quite often get in societies at this time, and actually earlier, mm -hmm. is that women have this very special relationship with the gods and the spirit world. They're almost supposed to have a kind of hotline to that world. Is that the same for the Vikings? I think so, yes. Certainly, they, uh, because of this authority they had within the house, they were, they were able to conduct the sacrifices to the gods and spirits, so they were often responsible for that. I think there is good evidence for that. Uh, they also practised healing. They, they knew their herbs and, and other ways of... of uh, getting people better, um, and some of them probably did things that we would describe as sorcery. That's quite difficult to find out exactly how they did that. I mean, that must have given them status in society, if, you, if you're in charge of magic. Absolutely, and probably some such women were feared. I mean, there are a lot of stories about mag women who, who practiced magic, and people were very afraid of them, really, because of their powers. Don't you sometimes get references to them being military sorceresses as well? So they're actually there on the battlefield? Yes, so well, these are the Valkyries. Um, they were the assistants of the god Odin, so they went to battles with him. They helped Odin select those warriors who would die in battle and be taken to Valhalla. Once they got to Valhalla, they served drink. Uh, to the warriors there. But I mean, these are imagined creatures. I mean, if we look at, we've got some fabulous swords here. Yes. I mean, do you think, would we ever have seen a real flesh and blood Viking woman wielding something like this? Well, I would say the sword is the male weapon par excellence. It, n swords uh, n are the status symbol warrior of the elite male warrior. However, um, our view keeps changing with new finds, and there's a very exciting find that was made just over a year ago in Denmark for, uh, by a metal detectorist, a very small silver figure of a female, um, very clearly female. She has long hair in a plait down the back. She has a long dress, 
and she's holding a shield and a sword. Um, and it's very, very interesting because normally Valkyries are associated with spears. They normally have a shield and a spear. It's, it would be very unusual for a Valkyrie to have a sword because of the male associations of the sword. So I don't quite, and I haven't quite worked out what that figure actually means, but she does have a sword. There's no doubt about it. It's a female figure with a sword. That is what is so brilliant about archaeology. You get these new little pieces in the jigsaw puzzle, which, which slotted in can give you a whole different picture, Absolutely, can't they? Yes. Because there is, isn't there, a, a Byzantine source that talks about in a, 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 there'd been a battle with the Vikings and the Byzantine army go and kind of rip the armour off and lo and behold, some of the fighters are, are women, they say. I, mean, I don't know if that's just a story, but, but they report it, it as very, There's a very similar story in Old Norse poetry um, about uh, a Valkyrie. She's uh, in, on, in battle with Odin and the hero Sigurd comes along and uh, cuts open her armor. It turns out to be a woman. But I think that's still, that's still part of the Valkyrie myth. It's, uh, she's in a very much an imagined figure, not a real one. I'll tell you what, unfortunately, I'm almost certain actually women's experience of the battlefield would have been the battle would have happened and then one or other of the army wins and the women then become plunder. They become human booty. And there's actually, there's some really horrible evidence of that over here. What you've got here, I think, really, is it's the kind of chilling truth of that story of Viking adventure. Well, certainly what we have here are leg irons, um, and they're an iron collar from Dublin. Uh, Dublin was the centre of the slave trade, so it's very likely that this is something used to restrain slaves, slaves that have been captured, perhaps, as a result of war. Mm. Uh, I mean, we actually use a word, don't we, the whole time, that, that the old Norse for slave was, a, was thrall. Absolutely. And we talk about being enthralled or enthralled by people. We should remember that, shouldn't we? Yes, well, slavery was a very important part of, of the Viking world. Um, and as I say, Dublin was the centre of the slave trade. And it's, it's very interesting because where did these people end up? Now, both men and women were captured as slaves. I think a lot of them were ransomed back by their families or sold on. But quite a lot of them also ended up um, traveling with the Vikings uh, to Iceland. The DNA evidence from Iceland shows that something like 60% perhaps of the female population of Iceland has its origins in, in Britain and Ireland. And it's quite likely that many of these were slaves that the Viking settlers brought with them. It's still very sobering, though, isn't it, looking at that? Because yes. I know there are some sources that say that the Vikings looked after their slaves very well. But still, I mean, that and, and a thousand times over just re represents so many personal tragedies. Well, if you were a slave, you had no rights whatsoever. You were just the property of your master. Quite different from uh, the people we were talking about earlier who had their freedom. But the Vikings were not just raiders, plunderers and slave traders. In many of the lands they invaded, they settled down. And in time, they took on the culture and the Christian religion of the conquered peoples. As the Vikings extended their power and influence along the seaboard of Western Europe and across the British Isles, they founded kingdoms in Northumbria and Ireland, in Normandy, of course. The Normans were originally Vikings. And eventually they came to rule England as a whole. Which brings us to this manuscript. Just take a look. This is the Liber Vitae, the Book of Lives, of the Monastery of the New Minster in Winchester. It was the family shrine and the mausoleum of the dynasty of Alfred the Great, the kings of Wessex and the creators of the Kingdom of England. And this was the book which contained the names of the benefactors of the monastery whose souls the monks would pray for. And here, in a full-page picture, in pride of place, is a young Viking. Just look, with his beard, it's Knut, the son of Svein Forkbeard, the king of Denmark. He's uh, got one hand on the gold cross that he's giving as a gift to the monastery and I love this detail his other hand holding the hilt of his sword he'd conquered England with the sword Canute had conquered England in 1016 he ruled till 1035 eventually controlling a great North Sea Empire not only England and Denmark but Norway and parts of Sweden and in that time, the young Viking became a respected member of the Christian community of kings in Europe. He issued Christian laws, he went on pilgrimage, 
to Rome. And of course, he's remembered in a famous English folk story in which he puts his throne on the seashore and commands the waves to go back, just to show his sycophantic courtiers that there are limits to a king's power, even to that of Knut the Great. Millennium is a rich melting pot of culture and ethnicity and we have assembled a crack team of experts who've been tracing the legacy of that cultural mix right across time. Martin Findol is a historian of language and can literally read the runes. Jane Carroll is working on Old Norse and Old English and in particular Old English place names and Turi King has become a household name thanks to rediscovering Richard III underneath that car park through DNA analysis um, and is now working on a large-scale project tracing the genetic legacy of the Vikings. Uh, now Martin there are runes in this room aren't there? Um, yeah, there are several objects with runic inscriptions in the exhibition. Um, we've got in the corner the very impressive uh, replica of the Yelling Stone from Denmark with, a, uh, with the inscription um, dedicated by Harold Bluetooth. Um, one of the most interesting objects, I think, is, is the Hunterston brooch. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very fine quality brooch made probably in the uh, 7th or 8th century in southwest Scotland. And it's a nice example of, uh, of the different cultural mix that you've got in, in that part of Britain at that time. The art styles are used by, used by the Scots and by the, and by the Anglo-Saxons are already influencing one another. And then uh, in the 10th century, this, this brooch was reacquired by somebody and reused, and it has an inscription on it in Viking runes, or Viking period runes, and it says, uh, Mel Brigda owns this brooch. What's most interesting about that is we've got this reuse of an, uh, of an old, beautiful object with an old Norse inscription using Scandinavian Viking writing, but the name on it is, is Celtic. It shows the, the, the influence of, of the language and the culture between Scandinavian Scots and, and Northumbrians. What about in the 21st century, apart from in graphic novels and fantasy TV series, <laughs> have the runes stayed with us? Um, well, they pop up all over the place in, in popular culture. One of the, one of the examples that, that everybody will be familiar with is the Bluetooth logo, um, which is what runologists call a, a bind rune. It's, a, it's two, two runic characters joined together. It's, a, it's an H and a B, Harold Bluetooth's initials. And the reason for that is that one of the engineers who was working on the Bluetooth project happened to be reading a historical novel about Vikings and, uh, and decided that as Harold 
uh, brought together the Danes under his rulership. That was a good analogy for, for the way Bluetooth enables different types of devices to, uh, to talk to one another and, and, um, and, and communicate. Very good. So thanks to him, we've all got a little bit of a Viking in our pockets. Uh, uh, what about the, the landscape that we walked through? I mean, in, in Britain, is, is that still a Viking landscape as far as the names are concerned? We're certainly walking through a, a, a linguistic Viking landscape. So um, every day we're using words which are of Scandinavian origin, even though obviously we think of them as being English. And, and is egg a, uh, a Viking word? That's what I've been told. Uh, yes, yes. It is. I yeah. love that. Egg yes. and window. Egg and window, yes. <laughs> so we think of them each time we throw an egg at a window. We think <laughs> of the Vikings. <laughs> and also um, on the signpost, we see um, place names which are derived from Scandinavian as well. So, yeah. Uh, and what are the clues if we're trying to find Vikings on the landscape? What, what do we need to look out for? Well, in England, the most obvious one is names ending in B. So this is a very common Scandinavian word, which means farm or village. So if I give you a couple of Leicestershire examples, we've got Odeby. Um, the first element of that is possibly the personal name Oithi, or possibly an adjective Oither, which means desolate or waste. And then um, Summerby, another Leicestershire example. Um, the first element of that is probably the Scandinavian personal name um, Sumorlithi, which means summer traveller. So those are two B names but some of the very important places have Scandinavian names. So Swansea, for example, means Svein's Island, um, and Fishguard mean, it has the Scandinavian word for fish and the Scandinavian word for enclosure in it. So uh, those, are, those are two examples of major places which bear Scandinavian names. And what about family names? Um, yes, so um, a number of surnames which are still in use um, in the present day derive from Scandinavian personal names. So um, a surname like Brand, for example, might come from the Scandinavian name Brander. Um, the surname Gunnel com uh, comes from the Scandinavian women's name Gunnhild, which was very, very popular in the Middle Ages. Um, Tolly is another family name which derives from a Scandinavian personal name. So these linguistic traces are all around us. Mm, and this is where our work overlaps because I use surnames as a way of looking for men who might have Scandinavian ancestry. So my work is looking at the genetic legacy of the Vikings and I'm really interested in, in looking in areas where we know that the Vikings got to. And this is how I use surnames. So surnames in this country are about on average 700 years old. And if I'm looking for people with very, very old surnames tied to the north of England, probably that's because their ancestry comes from there. So even though the Vikings didn't have hereditary names, I'm looking at people who've got surnames that probably originated about 700 years ago in the north of England, and then looking at their DNA, in particular the Y chromosomes, to see whether as a group they've got higher proportions of Scandinavian ancestry in areas that we know the Vikings got to. I know you've actually taken a sneaky DNA sample I from have. Gareth, yes. Michael and Neil. I was devastated that I couldn't be involved it's in that It's the surname experiment. thing, yeah. It's the surname, because I'm a girl, yeah. you know. But that'll be very, very interesting to yes. see how Viking they are. Yes, I need to do their wise. <laughs> tell me, kind of off the record, do you think you can tell if people have a bit of Viking in them? <laughs> is well... it scientifically <laughs> to do with their genes and their No, name? OK, so that, that is actually quite an important thing. You cannot look at a man's Y chromosome type and say, that's Viking or, or so on and so forth. But, I mean, given the, the number of ancestors that we all would have had alive at the time the Vikings were around, it's safe to say that we will all have Vikings somewhere in our family tree. We've all got a bit of Viking ancestry somewhere. That is amazing. There's a little bit of Viking in all of us. That's right. Thank you so much. What is this dream? cried Odin. Just before dawn, I dreamed I was preparing Valhalla for a new hero. I woke the guard of the dead and bid them rise up. Cover the benches, clean the cups, tell the Valkyries, bring wine fitting for a great chief. Noble heroes are coming from the world. My heart is glad. So we're nearing the end of our live broadcast, preparing our Viking boat burial. I'm with Professor Neil Price, who's carrying a mysterious looking Viking artifact, on which more very soon. Neil, now a thousand years ago to the day, a great battle was fought at Clontarf outside Dublin between the Irish kings and the Vikings, in which thousands were killed, including the great Irish hero Brian Boru. And this week, hundreds of reenactors have recreated that battle to vast audiences, tens of thousands. Um, Neil, 
A thousand years ago, exactly to this evening, the Vikings would be burying their dead at Clontarf. What do we learn about them from their burial customs? Well, there are many, many different kinds of Viking burials, including cremations. But what all of those funerals have in common is a sense of spectacle, of drama, of ceremony, um, and uh, remembrance. And also, uh, above all, the, the idea of preparing a dead person for transition to a new life in the next world with all their possessions intact. Um, sometimes human possessions. People could take their slaves into the grave with them. So if you imagine a warrior like those who died at Clontarf, um, buried with his weapons and armour, fighting fit to wake up in the next world and, and off he goes. In Valhalla, as we're taught yeah. at school. Indeed. The, the men, but women too? Um, Viking women could receive burials every bit as spectacular as the men. Mm. Um, and just now inside we heard about some of those sorceresses, um, mm. people buried with, uh, with amulets and charms and hallucinogenic drugs, and that's where this comes in. Um, <laughs> a staff of sorcery, a kind of witch's wand. Whoa, it looks like something you'd find in Ollivander's wand shop in Harry Potter, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and the kind of woman that would have wielded one of these might well have been a funeral director. We're learning more about them all the time. A Viking female funeral director. Brilliant, Neil. Thanks for sharing your scholarship with us tonight. Pleasure. Over to you, Bethany. Well, whatever the Vikings imagined their afterlife would be, the reality is that they do still live on in the genetic code of many millions of us. And the results of that DNA test of Michael, Gareth and your good self, Neil, what? will be published on the British Museum's website in just a couple of weeks. Um, just tell me honestly, are you going to be horrified or, or really secretly rather pleased if you discover you are a true child of the Vikings? I'm more than pleased. I'd be delighted. I come from the west of Scotland, so I think there's quite a chance that there's some Viking blood. And I love the idea of my ancestors a thousand years ago sailing up the Volga. No, I'm hoping. Although I have to say I have you down as coming from, from poet stock, perhaps rather than kind of genocidal raider. Well, I think as the statue of Odin shows, the poetic and the genocidal can coexist. What's so interesting about the Vikings, isn't it, is that whatever your genetic inheritance, actually they are almost inescapable because they have had such a massive impact on the shape of our modern world. That's absolutely true. They've obviously shaped the British Isles in lots of ways, very much today. But more than that, they've shaped the whole of Europe because they established the Baltic as the other great sea with the Mediterranean, where ideas move from the east to the west. And the, the view of Europe from Scandinavia that the Vikings had, embracing the Islamic Middle East and the Christian Western Europe, that's a really interesting idea for the world now, I think. It's so important that, that, that as global populations, we have to remember how intimately connected we have been for centuries. Forever, yeah. yes. But w what we mustn't do, though, is we mustn't whitewash the Vikings, because they did also do some truly horrific things. Well, they did. They destroyed wonderful things. But in an exhibition, you can't, of course, show what's been destroyed. What we can show are the things that the Vikings made and kept. And those things take us back to that world. And not just the world of their actions, but the world of their thoughts and their poetry, to the great Norse sagas, with their tales of heroes and dragons, and the great burning ships, the ships carrying the heroes into the afterlife. That goes on. So for good and for bad, they will still live on in our imaginations. I hope so. And now Michael has been dealing with a huge number of queries and questions about the exhibition. So back to you, Michael. We've had uh, messages from all over the country. Quick ones for Gareth. Um, Kat from Swansea, you talked about dendrochronology. How does it actually work? Well, dendrochronology is the analysis of tree rings. So as long as the timber's well enough preserved, you can see from the spacing of the, uh, of the rings in the wood how old the wood is and where it comes from. And that's how we know the ship was made in Norway in the 1020s. Brilliant. You're going to love this one. This is from Stephen in Liverpool. Why do we not see any Viking helmets with wings and horns on them? That's because they're an invention. They're invented in the 19th century. It's what the Victorians and the, and 
pre-Victorians thought Vikings ought to look like rather than what they did look like. I'm very, very disappointed. I, I, they were in my ladybird books when I was at Mine school. Mine too, but <laughs> yeah. hard facts. Have we got time for one more? Fantastic. This is a great question. What do contemporary Islamic writers say about the Vikings? They give us a mixed view. Um, we're told by one of them, on the one hand, they're the filthiest of God's creatures, um, but he also talks about how tall and good looking they are. Um, so they're, they're pretty, pretty damning on personal hygiene, but they but, quite like the look of them. But even handed. Thanks very much, Karen. Brilliant exhibition. Thanks for being with us tonight. Well, as our crew of mildly intimidating 21st century Vikings take up their final positions for the burial, it is time for us to bid you farewell. We hope you've enjoyed yourselves. If you want to learn more about the Vikings, just go to the British Museum website, britishmuseum.org, and please carry on speaking to us on Twitter. Hashtag Vikings Live at British Museum. Michael, they've kept us from one another for 90 minutes. We're going to leave you now with the Vikings and their torchlit burial from the British Museum, live in London. Goodbye, or as the Vikings say, farewell. Farewell. <laughs>